through on the mic. I'm sorry if it did, that's a gross noise. Um, howdy y'all, welcome. Uh, today we are going to be working on um, workshop for our last section, the law of sines and the law of cosines. And even though your textbook calls it one skill, it's really not, it's two skills, but it kind of fits into the bigger picture of all trigonometry for us. Keep in mind when it comes to completing triangles, we have our flow chart. Number one, is it a right triangle? Is it not a right triangle? If it is a right triangle, we have two very powerful tools in our toolbox that will crack that safe. Law, uh, I'm sorry, SOHCAHTOA and or the Pythagorean theorem, whatever the nature of the given information may be. But if it's an oblique triangle, then what you are gonna have to do is decide whether or not to use the law of sines or the law of cosines. And when it comes to differentiating those two, how do we know which one to use? What are we looking for? Mr. Opposite Mr. angle pairs. We are looking for an opposite angle pair. That is to say, if it's a triangle ABC, we need angle A and side A, or angle B and side B, or angle C and side C. You need one of those pairings for it to work. Otherwise, you must then default to the law of cosines. And so, even though these two questions look different, they're actually not that different. Item number one, I need you to complete the triangle DEF. I didn't draw it for you, but it doesn't matter because the way that this information is presented, it's unambiguous. If you would like to draw it first and then solve it, you should probably do that. Uh, however, if you just follow the rules that I suggested, you should be able to do item number one even without drawing it. Just being given the information this way, we can tell whether or not this is right, we can also tell whether or not this uh, will be law of sines or law of cosines. And then in item number two, this is a preview as to what we'll be doing after the AP test. Uh, after the AP test, we'll be working on our final chapter, which is all about circles and these types of tricky calculations that we can do with circles. And so here's a weird thought. Um, I have a line which goes from one side of a circle to another. This line, MN, is referred to with a special piece of vocab, NM would be considered a chord, C-H-O-R-D. And what I would like you to do is calculate for me the length of the chord, but all that you know is that this angle right here is theta. And oddly enough, you have enough information to do this. Think really hard about both what we've been doing in trig and also what the rules are for a circle and you can very quickly generate the chord equation. Uh, take a few minutes on this, and then we'll go over it together. Mr. Robinson, my mom sent you the email like with the information about like the letter. I got it. Okay. Oh, Mr. Robinson, for the circle, you don't want any arc length or sector. You just want the chord measurement. No, this is not, I mean, we, next chapter, we will talk about arc lengths and um, sector area. Uh, that stuff, I think, is relatively easy to figure out yeah. how to do, because it's really just fractions times the circle equations that you already know. Mm -hmm. This is more technical and elegant. Okay. I, I would actually assert it's hella elegant. It's like one of the coolest things we're going to look at um, uh, next chapter. I just want to use it now, because I think it's also a good look at trait. Uh, and then just a quick reminder for those of you who have short uh, memories like myself, which is why I always do these reminders, man. It's not just for y'all to be on the right page. It's also so that I don't forget what I'm doing. Uh, there's no class tomorrow because I have a, a six hour test to take. So tomorrow at this time of day, I will be about like a third of the way through. Um, so yeah, just to like make sure that I'm mentally fit for that tomorrow. Um, I'm just gonna take the whole day off. If we were at physical school, you guys would have a sub, but I'm not gonna like hire a sub to hold an alternate Zoom session, like who cares? So tomorrow is your last day to prep for the chapter test, which is on Friday. Uh, on Friday, we will have the chapter test, which will, like I said, we went over yesterday, rehash all of the old trig stuff from the test. And the only things that will be added on it is there will be um, two elevation and depression questions. The same math as normal trig, it's just vocab. Remember that if this is the horizon, this is an angle of elevation. This is an angle of depression. Use Sokotoa and Pythagorean theorem um, correctly. 
And then past that, the other four questions that I'm adding on there will be law of sines and law of cosines questions. Uh, know how to do the math and know how to follow the flow chart so you know which recipe it is that I'm asking you to follow. And as long as you follow the right recipe, you'll always cook up some delicious trick. Um, Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm just opening the homework assignment on my other monitor because after we're done with this, we'll have workshop time. I just want to make sure that I have all of them open so I know what you guys are asking questions about. We'll get started. Oh yeah, one other thing. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit, I said it, I put it in the box here at the top. Um, I want to talk about a recently discovered animal called the um, yellow rumped leaf-eared mouse. And I mean, it's a really cute name, but that's because it is a very cute animal, but that's not the only reason why we're talking about it. Uh, it does have a yellow butt and its ears are all crumpled up and they look like leaves. Um, but I just want to talk about it because it's nice to have a piece of uh, interesting science news. It's a new species? Uh, yeah, newly discovered. Um, it's nice to have pieces of science news that aren't just COVID. Like, don't get me wrong, all the people doing COVID research, all that stuff is really important um, in terms of actually controlling the way that the disease breaks out. Uh, it's just that all of that news tends to be particularly depressing or alarming or whatever. Um, and scientific research is probably gonna slow down really bad in a month or two, uh, just because since nobody can go to campus right now, nobody can get data, like labs are mostly shut down right now. But luckily everybody threw their research that they had done previously onto flash drives and took it home with them if they were smart. So scientific papers are still coming out over this last month or so, because people are like, wrapping up the research that they were doing in the lab uh, back in uh, March. Does this uh, mouse live in mountains? Yeah, and that is the news item. Um, that It's always interesting to find uh, species in places where you wouldn't expect them, right? Like to find a fish in the desert is kind of a cool thing, just because that's not something you would expect. Though you should know there are fish in the desert and they're really evolutionarily strange in order to like be adapted to that living condition. Mm. Um, the thing that makes the yellow rumped leaf eared mouse special is the fact that it is by far the highest elevation mammal um, ever discovered in the world. It's, it lives at an elevation of 22,000 feet, which is um, like half the cruising altitude of short airplane flights. Like this thing lives in a place where there's very little oxygen, which is crazy. It's wild that this is even possible. Uh, simply because, like, based on the type of animal that you're talking about, those animals have very different needs. That is to say, like, what a mammal needs versus what a fish needs versus what a bird needs versus what a reptile needs are all very different. And so you have some places that are very rich, like the forest, where all of their needs can be met at the same time. And so um, you have a lot of biodiversity. But as you go to places with very extreme conditions, you get places with a very, very low biodiversity. Like if you go far enough north, you get to a place where you're so cold, there's basically no animals except penguins, um, uh, polar bears, and killer whales. Like that is it in terms of like fauna uh, and the fish that those things live off of. So to find an animal outside of where you normally discovered that type of animal is always a notable discovery. Uh, it's wild that a mammal can live that high just because you know we're mammals mammals are wicked inefficient. Like, do any of y'all have a pet lizard? I used to. Oh, and how often did you feed that lizard? Uh, I don't know, my mom did it. I was oh, little. okay. Well, if you don't know, lizards, in terms of food, they have basically no needs compared to us. Like even alligators and Komodo dragons, they can go entire years without eating. Why do you think it's possible that they have such a slow metabolism? How can you survive with such little food? Because they're cold-blooded? That is the main reason why. Maintaining your body temperature requires a ton of energy, and expending energy requires a ton of food, 
and to burn that food up in your bloodstream, turn it into energy, that requires a ton of oxygen. So typically you need mammals to live in places where food is highly available and uh, oxygen is highly available so that we can be exothermic and maintain our own internal body temperature. Finding a mammal this high is wild and it's also a fun science item just because it's uh, very cute as far as little rats go. Um, is that okay in terms of a non-COVID related science item? Yeah. Um, yeah, but do you think the mouse, it just, like, it traveled to the to that volcano, or it's been there for a while? That's true of, I mean, you may find yourself in Los Angeles right now, but that's because your ancestors traveled here, and I'm not talking about, like, just from Armenia, but your ancestors from Armenia traveled there from Africa. So... No matter what way you talk about it, if you choose a long enough time scale, all life on Earth came from a common location. So to better define your question, it would then be like, what time scale? So what time scale are you asking about? Like I've been, I, I was asking, do you think in the past year, it, it's, it like traveled to that volcano? Oh, past year? No, no. I thought you were talking about like, oh, did it arrive here tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago? Like, no matter what, there was a time when that mountain, well, hell, there was a time when that mountain didn't exist, but there was also a time when that mountain existed and this mouse didn't inhabit it. But the only way that you can get that kind of adaptation is evolutionarily. So that mouse must have had ancestors who lived at lower elevations, who over several generations slowly were able to live higher and higher and higher up the mountain as they developed the adaptations that you would have to develop in order to live that high. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's true of like all adaptations. They develop slowly, allowing the animals to have more and more and more ability with each passing generation. Uh, but like, could it just get up there in a year? Nah, it would suffocate. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, adaptation to high elevation is a really common one. Do you know what the main thing it is that you need in order to uh, get up to higher elevation? You need more what? Oxygen. Uh, so indirectly, yes, you need a way to get more oxygen, but how is that typically done biologically? How does oxygen get into your lungs and then to the rest of your body? What does it have to travel through? Um, your, like... Respiratory system? No, your respiratory system is basically your lungs, but I'm saying oxygen comes in through your lungs. Where does it go? How does it get to your muscles? Oh, your bloodstream. Bloodstream. Exactly, right through your bloodstream. So typically what happens in animals that are uh, better at high elevation, they just have a higher red blood cell count so that they're more efficient at taking the oxygen out of the air and forcing it into their bodies. Um, now to get the crazy red blood cell count that that mouse has, that takes thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution for those uh, adaptations to occur. But uh, if you were to go live somewhere with high elevation, like if you moved to Denver, Colorado, and you were to live there for a few years, it would increase your red blood cell count by a measurable amount. Mm. Okay. Uh, bodies can adapt a little bit to higher elevation situations slowly, uh, but for it to adapt in a big way, you need evolution to take its course, or like in the case of humans going up Mount Everest, we don't wait for the red blood cell count, we just bring cans of oxygen so that people don't faint. So people in Kansas have like a lower um, bl red blood cell count than us because we live a little higher? We don't live significantly high. We live basically at sea level. Um, oh, we even live, if you live on like the mountain area? These mountains are foothills. They're not that that high. Like when you go from Los Angeles up the 134, it's uphill the whole way. And then you're in Pasadena, right? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So Pasadena uh, is a little bit higher elevation than the rest of, of, of um Los Angeles. Los Angeles is really close to sea level, really close to zero. Pasadena is only at an elevation of 863 feet. This mouse lives at 20,000 feet. Oh. Uh, and on top of that, uh, Denver, Colorado elevation. Uh, Denver is at an elevation of 16, oh, I'm sorry, 1,600 meters. Denver elevation of feet. Uh, Denver is at an altitude of 5,200 feet. Oh. Denver is almost six times higher up in the air than Pasadena is. So yeah, that change from the beach to Pasadena is nothing compared to landing in Denver and trying to breathe. So um, like, but Armenia, like your bloodstream has to be higher because it's a plateau. It's like all high. 
Uh, Armenia's elevate. Oh my God. Oh, oh, that's the highest point. So the uh, peak of Mount uh, Aragats, 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 yeah. uh, yeah. fourteen hundred feet. So that's starting to get to the elevation where the mouse lives. Uh, but oh yeah, and Armenia's lowest point is thirteen hundred feet. So yeah, Armenia's right. lowest point is higher than Pasadena. Because it's a highland, all of it is high. It just yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I assume your average Armenian citizen has a higher than average blood count as a result, at least higher than a Los Angelian yeah. um, or an Angelino or whatever way you want to think about it. Um, but yeah, man, that's why when people try to get ready for marathons, they do high altitude training where they move to another city with a higher altitude to get their red blood cell count up. Like if I was rich, if I didn't have to work, man, I would totally like move to Denver for two months before the marathon every year just to get the blood cells up. Um. Hey, anyway, let's do these two questions and then we'll spend the rest of this time letting you guys do your homework. Or I see that two of y'all already turned in the second homework. That means when we're done with the warm up, you're free to roll. Or if you just want to hang out, you can do that too. Um, item number one complete triangle DEF based on the given information. So without drawing the triangle, let's roll this homie through our flow chart. Is it a right triangle? Negative. It couldn't be, right? Why can it not be a right triangle? Because one of the angles is 105. There's an obtuse angle. Exactly. The moment you have even one obtuse angle, you literally can't have a right triangle. You have too many angles. It couldn't add up to less than 180. Um, and then that kicks us over in our flow chart to the side with the oblique triangles, where we have two rules, law of sines and law of cosines. Which one is this? Law of cosines. It has to be the law of cosines. Once we realize we're dealing with an oblique triangle, we have a simple check to see if we're doing law of sines or law of cosines. Do we have an opposite side and angle pairing? Do we have D and angle D? Do we have E and angle E? Do we have F and angle F? Of the no. numbers we were given, do we have a pair? No. No. So now that we've realized that we're starting off with law of cosines, I'm going to go ahead and draw it now to help organize our thinking for those of y'all who benefit from that. Uh, so first off, I'll draw a length of 17. So this is going to be D is equal to 17. And then I face a 105 degree angle. I'll use the protractor so that we get an appropriate scale. So over here on this side, 105 would point a little past 90. So it'll be 100 and then 105. So my next segment should be in line with that dot. So now that's a 105 degree angle right there. So this is uh, corner E. And then from that point, corner E, side length F needs to be a length of 10, uh, which I will draw out using a similar scale to the one I used for the line previous. So about this long for 10 units. Uh, so this is side length D, this is side length F, and so, Based on those first three numbers, I'll just finish this off. Well, it's a triangle. So all I got to do is connect those outliers. And now I can also label my angles. If this was side length F, this is necessarily corner F. If this is length D, this is necessarily side length D. And our given information is this, 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 uh, which means that we are solving for that, that, and that. Uh, is that first part okay? Yeah. yeah. What, in, what information do we have the ability to solve for right now? This is law of cosines, and what kind of data were we given? You're given a SAS, side, angle, side. Side, angle, side. And so what can we solve for first? You can solve for... Um, side length E. Very I'd good. say side length E. It has to be side length E first, and then after we fit that first piece of the puzzle into place, then we can start using the law of signs, and there's different pathways, pathways we could take to the answer. So we're going to use the law of cosines to get side length E. So that is to say E squared is equal to D squared plus F squared minus 2DF cosine E. Keep in mind the pattern. This letter and this letter are the same. And then the inside four letters are the same. So if I want E, I write E equals, and I know I'll end up with cosine E over here. 
and then that pushes the other three letters into the middle, where this part looks like the Pythagorean theorem, and then this part is just minus 2d that. What algebra do I do to get side length e alone? Square root. Square root. So side length e has to be equal to the square root d squared plus f squared minus 2df cosine e, and then the rest is just, well, substitution. So this is going to be equal to the square root of 17 squared plus 10 squared minus 2 times 10 times 17 cosine of 105 degrees. No, this doesn't simplify. There is no way to simplify this up to the step. From here, we enter this into our calculator in order to get whatever this number is going to end up being. And uh, for the sake of doing trig in here, just to make sure that we all have a standard um, format to write our answer, if it's an unavoidable decimal, please stick to two decimal places. Always round to your hundredths place. That instruction will, of course, be given on Friday's test. So this is to say 17 squared plus 10 squared minus 2 times 17 times cosine 105. I'll hit enter. So this is what's on the inside of the square root. So I'm going to hit second square root, second answer, because if your calculator has an answer button, it will automatically take the number from the previous step and plug it into the next one. I find this is one of the cleanest ways to put this stuff into a calculator. So that means side length E out there is 19.94. I got 21.84. Yeah, I got 21.84. Oh, that is the correct answer. I made a mistake entering this in my calculator. I skipped the input of a number. I missed the 10 on the second part. Oh. So uh, up here, I was going too fast, and I said it out loud. I said 2 times 10 times 17, but I missed the 10. So I'm going to go ahead and re-enter it down here and hit Enter. And now I'll take the square root of this number. And our side length is 21.84, yeah? Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Okay, so side length E is equal to 21.84 units. That's one third of our answer for completing this triangle. And now that we've done that, we have unlocked a side angle pair, right? That's why you never ever have to use the law of cosines more than once. So now that I have angle E and side E, how do we get our next angle? We'll do law of sines. Law of sines and, hey, a little bit of freedom. We could solve for side length F or side length D. It's up to us. So which one would you like to get first? F. Okay. Angle F. Uh, so that is to say sine F over F is equal to sine E over E. And boy, F and E are nice letters. They're a lot easier to tell apart lowercase and uppercase than the letter C is, huh? Um, and now I'm going to solve for angle F. So angle F is going to be equal to the inverse sine of F sine E over E. I did two steps of algebra there if you can't see it. I'm going to start doing that more and more as we end the year, just because as you guys get better at math, like as you move into algebra two, math will start looking that way. You'll be expected to see how the layers of the onion all come together at the same time. If you can't see this, do it for yourself to make sure that you can get to a point where this is natural. I'm multiplying by F, and then I'm hitting it with an inverse sign. So the F ends up on the, inver or on the inside, and then the inverse sign ends up on the outside. And then we just plug in our values. So F is going to be equal to inverse sign of uh, 10 times sine of uh, 20, I'm sorry, uh, 105, 105. That proportion turned into that like equation. Oh, that's an E, okay. Yeah, uh, and so we execute this calculation. So again, I'm gonna do the inside and the outside as two steps. So it's gonna be 10 sine 105 then divided by 21.84. Now that I have this decimal, I have to hit it with inverse sign still. So I'll do second sign to get inverse sign, and then second answer so that it automatically plugs in the decimal in the last step. And that tells us that angle F is 26.25 degrees.
And so I have a triangle. I got three sides and two angles. Now for the hard third part, angle. how do I get the last angle? Third angle. Third angle theorem. Just keep in mind that all the angles must add up to 180. So to get the last angle, I'll just take the other two angles, 105 plus 26.25, and add them up. And if they have to add up to 180, then that means that that other angle has got to be 48.75 degrees. So that tells me that angle D is 48.75 degrees. So basically when you have a problem like this, then you do law of cosines, then law of sines, and then the third angle theorem. For an SAS question, always, yeah, always. Oh, okay. Yep, it's always that recipe. So uh, even though the equations are, are simple, because of the way that we're limited in terms of what information this applies to, there's really just a few recipes to know. We got one recipe for SAS, one recipe for SSS. Uh, okay. okay, and now item number two. Wait, sorry, was there a question? Yeah, what's the SSS formula? Just so I can write it down. Uh, we went over the notes yesterday. Let me pull it up. Can ask that question. Um, oh, by the way, so I've been keeping, and you know, keep in mind all of these notes are, um, I do uh, fronts only because it's on the document cam. Look at how many notes I have just for geometry. Wow. I mean, you guys, First. I guess you guys have a similar number of notes. You have half of this, right? If you've been keeping your notes front and back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, every day after notes, I just take them and I toss them over in that uh, filing cabinet. And yo, that thing is almost full. Um, I do it online so that I don't waste paper. You what now? I do it like online, like I write it on an iPad. Oh, do you use uh, Microsoft OneNote? No, I use Notability. Uh, I haven't seen that one. I, I would recommend, I mean, that's good. It's good to store your notes digitally because when I have to go back to my notes from undergrad, I have to literally go dig out a banker's box full of notebooks, which I've been doing to prep for the test I have tomorrow. I was like, oh man, I should look at my electrodynamics notes from undergrad. And I was like digging through all these old 5M notebooks. It would be a lot nicer if it was just like a folder or whatever. But most of my homies who take their notes on a tablet use um, Microsoft OneNote. I'm not telling you to switch, but I would at least check it out. Okay, yeah, my um, sister's because she uses it for college, so she said it's good, you should use it too. Notability? Yeah. Uh, I don't have a tablet, but if I get one, I'll give it a look. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, these were the recipes, and we talked about this real quick yesterday. So today in the warm-up, we did an SAS. So first law of cosines to get a side, use um, that angle with the law of sines to get the next angle, and then finally, third angle theorem. If it's SSS, which is a, in your homework a bunch, and it's uh, the question that we finished yesterday, the first thing you do is you solve for an angle using the law of cosines. Once you have that first angle, then you use the law of sines to get a second angle. And again, this solves for an angle, this solves for an angle. So once you have two angles, third angle theorem. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. And now finally, uh, I have a circle, and um, this circle has two uh, rays inside of it that originate at the center. I know that they originate at the center because a circle is typically named by its central point. Um, and so what I want to know is, what is an equation that I could use to calculate mn given the values here? And the reason why we're going to do this for an equation is that I want an equation which always works to give the chord length. Even if it was in some other direction, I want to be able to write an equation that will still give us the chord. So even if we're talking about a way smaller angle on the other side over here, again, this equation that we're about to write works even to calculate this length if this is my theta, for example. So I want an equation which can give us this length as well as this length. What is the relationship that we're looking at here? The bigger the angle, the bigger the... The length. The bigger the length on the other side, which we're calling a chord. So the bigger I open up my angle, the bigger of a measurement that we are going to get. And here's a really good way to check to see if our answer is correct when we're done. How long would the chord be if the angle was 180? What's a 180 degree angle? The line. If I took these two lines, like these two lengths on the inside, and I opened it up to 180, it would make a flat line that goes right across the circle. What's a line that goes through the middle of a circle called? It's a diameter. 
So if this equation that we come up with is correct, if you plug in 180, it should return back to you the diameter. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So what kind of structure are we looking at here? What shape is this on the inside of the circle? Mm, an obtuse angle or a triangle. It's a triangle. Is this a right triangle? It's an oblique triangle. This is, in fact, an oblique triangle, or at least it can be an oblique triangle unless theta happens to magically be 90. And so we can actually solve for MN here in unambiguous terms based on that inside angle theta. And it has everything to do with, well, what is this? The radius. This is the radius R and this is the radius R. And we're solving for this. So this is an oblique triangle and what kind of information are we working with? A side, an angle and a side, right? Mm -hmm. So are we gonna answer this with the law of sines or with the law of cosines? Law of cosines. Let's go ahead and hit this with the law of cosines, and it will actually give us an equation which always calculates the chord length. So this is to say our chord, mn squared, is going to be equal to, it's the same structure as this right here, right? So what do I write? r squared plus r squared, which is 2r squared minus two r, r time, minus two times r times r, cosine theta. So this is the law of cosines, except the special case where both of the other side lengths are both the same. Because if we're drawing this inside of a circle, any length that goes from the middle to the outside edge is one of the infinite number of radii. So I know that the two short sides of this oblique triangle, they're both equal. They're both just the radius. Let's clean that up. So this is to say that mn squared is going to be equal to 2r squared minus uh, 2r squared cosine theta. And how can I clean this up? It's just going to be mn equals cosine theta. Uh, say that again? MN, is it mn squared equals cosine theta? No, what happened to r? Oh, because I thought 2r squared minus 2r squared, they get canceled out because they're getting subtracted. That would be, so that's not true, though I find that to be a really common mistake uh, that one year after algebra students make. Um, that would be true if this wasn't multiplied by something. Effectively, what oh, you're yeah. saying is that would be the same as 2 minus 2x equals x just because there's two minus two, but is two minus two x, x? No. No, this is not true. What is something I could do here though, mathematically? We divide. You can factor out the two. Those are both the same thing. We could divide out the common term, we could factor. So here I'm gonna factor out the common term. So this is two times one minus x. That is basically the extent to which you could work with this, but these don't cancel because this two is tied to x. So uh, let's go ahead and use that exact same logic up above. So no, they don't cancel. That's a really important thing to realize and look out for. Man, that's bright. Why is that bright? Okay, calm down, camera. What can we do, though? Zoop. What can we pull out? 2r squared. mn squared is going to be equal to 2r squared times 1 minus what? Cosine theta. One minus cosine theta. Uh, and so here, if I take a square root on both sides, right? And then the uh, uh, chord length must be equal to the square root of two, uh, then times r, uh, which if you take the square root of r squared will just be r, times the quantity of one minus Yeah, one minus cosine theta. So this right here, if you know the radius of the circle and you know the angle theta, pop it in and it will always tell you what the chord length is. Is something like this with the circle included in our lesson? Uh, no, this is a look at what next chapter is about. Next chapter we'll be talking about circles, but this is a thing that you should be able to solve out 
right now because it's actually just a law of cosines question. Oh, okay. And this is it a possibility that this might be a bonus question on the test? I mean, the bonus question could be anything. So sure, yeah. Uh, I had a question like this like a week ago, and I didn't know how to answer it, so I just use like logic. Like it has to be less than the diameter, so that's just like how I solved it. But now I can actually solve that question. So that's yeah, this actually is kind of cool. This is the full blown explicit way to do this. And uh, just so y'all have a little bit of context for how you're planning out your futures or whatever, here's where you would see questions that are straight up like this. You wouldn't see this until uh, SAT math uh, two. So this question is even outside the scope of the math for the regular vanilla SAT. This wouldn't be on the SAT. This is past that. You would only see um, a standardized test question like this if you were planning on going to like an engineering program or a science program in your undergrad. Typically, those types of programs require the submission of an extra test, which is a SAT that instead of being three hours, it's only one hour. And instead of being about math and English, it's only about the math stuff. And uh, it goes all the way up to pre-cal. So um, don't trip on this. This is like a pretty fancy manipulation. You won't be expected to pass a test with this until like the end of your junior year. Uh, anyway, this time is yours. If you have any questions whatsoever on any of the assignments, either um, the regular book assignment or the additional law of sine and law of cosine practice that I assigned you, um, this time is yours to work. And if you have any questions, holler at me. If you're one of the two people who already turned it in, you have a nice day, head out, and I'll see you guys on Friday after my uh, make or break test tomorrow. I'm signing up for the Microsoft Word one, but it's like being weird. It's not like doing it. Um, uh, yeah, the problem with that stuff is uh, it works well, but you have to tie it to a Microsoft account. Yeah, and I don't like have one, so I just made one and it's been connecting for so long. Yeah, it takes a while to first verify, plus you have to verify your email account or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I have a Microsoft account because I built my own computer. So I have a Microsoft account just because keeping your Microsoft account login is the easiest way to install Microsoft on a new machine. Every time I make a new computer, I literally install a pirated version of Microsoft just because it's easier to do that. And then it pops up and it's like, hey, I connected to the internet and uh, I'm a pirated copy of Microsoft. I'm going to delete myself unless you log in. And then when I log in, it's like, oh, okay, you actually already paid for a Microsoft um, install and it just like fixes it and verifies it. Yeah. That's the only reason I have one. Mr. Robinson, mm -hmm. I have a question for the homework. Yes, let me get rid of this sheet. Uh, yeah, which one? It's um the... No, on page 37, law yep. of cosines. Uh, which number? The no, uh, number one. When okay. I do it, and when I try to, when I do it, and the equation that I'm going to plug into the calculator, I get um, in the square root, 12 squared plus 10 squared minus 2, in parentheses, 12 times 10, cosine 12. But I don't know if I, I don't know if I plug it into the calculator correctly. Oh, that's cosine, cosine 62, brother. You can only plug angles into cosine. I think that's your issue. So it's, um. Oh, I, I read it wrong. That's why. Yep. Yeah. yeah. 14 squared plus 12 squared times two times 14 times 12 times cosine of 62 degrees. Yeah. It's just because you pulled that one wrong number, but yeah, entering this into your calculator should give you uh, the correct value for X. Okay. Uh, well, Wait, you for those you of you following along, on that page? is X is equal After? to uh, thirteen point five ish. Okay. Mr. Robinson, I Thank finished, you. so can I go? Yep, I already said you could. Have a nice day. All right. How, good luck on your test. Thanks. Um, okay. So number two, you heard a request. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for question number two, we're looking for angle B. So what I'm going to do, if I know that I am using the law of cosines, and in this case, like, because that first worksheet is broken up, you don't have to follow the flow chart. You know that if you're on the law of cosines page, it's law of cosines. So if we want angle B and we have to use the law of cosines, we're going to choose the law of cosines formula that has angle B in it. So B squared, I don't know why I'm doing this in red. I think that's harder to read. B squared 
uh, is equal to, oh, and now this one looks all jacked up like 3D pictures look when you're not looking through 3D glasses. Uh, anyway, B squared is equal to A squared plus C squared minus 2AC cosine of B. And before I plug anything in, I'm going to solve for angle B first. Now, to solve for angle B, I have to get it all alone. So I have to get rid of these guys, and then I got to get rid of this factor up front. So I'm going to subtract over these numbers. So I get B squared minus the quantity of A squared plus C squared is equal to negative 2AC cosine B. Then I'm going to divide by negative 2AC. And algebra tells me that if I do that on one side, I got to do it on both sides. So this cancels with that. And that will get cosine B alone. And so my final step is going to be that B is equal to the inverse cosine because this is cosine B. So if I want to strip that cosine off, I have to do it with inverse cosine. And algebra says that if I do that over here, it'll also get done over here. So if you pop this into inverse cosine, this will tell us what that angle is. And again, if you are unsure about what things simplify with what other things, you should know that none of this is reducible. This doesn't divide in any useful or significant way. B squared divided by 2AC, nothing cancels. A squared plus C squared divided by 2AC could be done, but you would get something even uglier than if you had just left it alone. Uh, if you take this and you whip it around to get angle B alone, honestly, this is the simplest look you could possibly get from it. So from here, all that we have to do is plug in our side lengths. So this will be equal to inverse cosine of, well, let's see, B is 10, so that'll be 10 squared minus the quantity of uh, A is 11, 11 squared plus 12 squared, then divided by negative 2 times A, which was 11, times C, which was 12. And if you take that thingum and feed it into your calculator, you'll get the answer. Uh, but like I said before, um, a lot of the times it's easier to do it as two big chunks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this inside stuff first. So that inside stuff is just 10 squared minus the quantity of 11 squared plus 12 squared. So this right here is actually just going to give me the numerator. So the numerator is just negative 165. Now I'm going to divide it by the denominator, which is dividing it by negative 2 times 11 times 12. So now I know that this whole fraction is 0 0.625. And now finally, to turn it into an angle, I have to take the inverse cosine. So it'll be inverse cosine of this wacky decimal. And that final angle for angle B, angle B is equal to 51.32 degrees. Mr. Oh, Robinson. Thank you. No matter what, when you're solving for an angle, all of this manipulation from here to here to here is the same. So if you just have this on the side ready to go, this is a pre-solved equation for getting an angle out of the law of cosines. This work is always the same. So if you want to set this equation aside for later, it's uh, powerful. So if we just take, the, like, can we just start with that? If we want? As, long, as long as you know where it comes from, yeah. Because when I'm talking about looking for work, I'm talking about looking for this, looking that you substitute in the values before you get here. Yeah. And obviously it's different for every, like, one, the ones that start with A, B, and C. It, right. So if you, for the other two, uh, and, you know, for weird reasons, they're technically called rotations of the law of cosines that, like, we're rotating the letters around into different positions. Yeah. If you start with one of the other rotations, you get a different equation for the final angle. But what that final equation means is always the same. Oh, okay. So, yeah, if you wanted angle A, this would have a different rotation to it. It would be A squared minus B squared plus C squared divided by 2BC. Or if you put C here, this letter would become C, and then the other two would become AB. But you can rotate it to find out what's what. Okay. And I think the Microsoft, um, the like I did it, I think it works better on like Microsoft tablets. Mm, I'll disagree, um, and not from firsthand knowledge, but because uh, the people I know who use it all use it on iPads and really like it. And uh, recently, we had a professor who was doing Zoom lectures 
but instead of him doing lectures like this on a, like a physical camera with physical paper, he has the webcam in front of him. And then the thing that he's broadcasting is actually his iPad's screen that he's doing the notes on, uh, mm. which, you, you know, he's a good lecturer, but I've kind of been hating it because his iPad is never charged, man. And we can see the whole screen. So like lecture starts and we're like, dog, are you really at 7% to start off a two hour lecture? And then by the end, it's at like 1% and it's popping up with a low battery warning. But anyway, some of the other nerds in that class who have iPad tablets, they were like, hey man, like you should switch to OneNote, you'll really love it. And then he switched to OneNote and he really loves it. <laughs> I think it's just a matter of spending time with it. Yeah. Oh, also probably the nicest thing about uh, OneNote um, is that with your Microsoft account, right? Let's say you take notes on your iPad and you save them to your OneNote account. Um, if you then log on on a desktop computer, you just go to OneNote.com and log in with the same account information. You can automatically access all of your notes also on your laptop. Oh, and it's cool when it's online because if you want a physical copy, you can just print it. Yeah, exactly. Or if you were trying to share it with a homie, you could just email them a PDF. Mm -hmm. The thing, other than iPad, the thing, uh, Microsoft computers are cool. The ones that are touch screen and they have a keyboard, like my dad uses that for work, and it's like pretty cool. Oh, my, the laptop that I'm teaching you guys from is also a touch screen. Yeah. So, um, remember that, cal did I show you guys my calculator app? No. Nope. Yeah. Oh. So when I'm teaching the pre-cal kids how to use their graphing calculator, I can share this screen with them, which is a digital ga graphing calculator, and you see my mouse. Oh, and you can, like, click on the buttons. Oh, that's really cool. I know. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, and just so y'all know, this software is free. It's called Wabbit EMU, and it lets you run this calculator software, the TI-84, like, but on your computer screen. So when I'm teaching them how to use it, it's just tight because it, like, you know, it's a graphing calculator, so it has all these cool graphing options. But more importantly, it lets me show the buttons that I'm using. So, like, for that last thing I just input, I could be like, you do 10 squared minus the quantity of 11 squared plus 12 squared or whatever. But since my computer is a touch screen, I can also just, like, touch the laptop screen to do the rest. So, it just, like, works. Does the website have like legal permission to use this like on its thing? Isn't it like trademark? Uh, before I answer that question, let me get, just go ahead and start with the really important disclaimer that what I'm about to say is not actually, oh, I didn't put it wrong too, uh, is that what I'm about to say is not actually legal information. I am not a lawyer and as such, you should not take this uh, advice as legal counsel. This is simply my best understanding of the situation based on somebody who follows it. So here's what this is. This is called an emulator. And what an emulator is, and I'm sure the people in the class who play a lot of video games have come across that term a lot. Um, what an emulator is, is it's a way that you can make hardware, but in software. So instead of having a physical thingy like this, this is running software that is copying what this physical thing does. Um, all old video game consoles have the exact same kind of thing. So you could get an NES emulator and play all of the old Mario games just on your computer by plugging in a controller. I won't tell you how to do that, but if you figure out how to do that, more power to you. Um, of course, video game companies, software companies, they do not appreciate this because it makes it so that they can't sell old copies of their games. Like for the most part, if Nintendo were to put out a Mario game on Switch, I'd be like, ha ha, I'm good. I still have the original. Um, I am not going to buy that from you. Um, uh, however, based on like past court cases or whatever, here's the weird legal area that we're at with emulators, at least in terms of video games. You are allowed to back up your own stuff. So that's why CD burners got out there because technically the legal reason that you would use a CD burner is you were like, I got this $20 album. I'm gonna make a copy of it in case my original copy breaks. I wanna still have the music, right? But what were people actually using CD burners for? 
to give it to you're... people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To make a copy of a new CD for your homie, which that is technically illegal because you're only yeah. supposed to make backups for your own collection's purpose, right? Um, so here's the weird legal area that emulators are in. If I got a USB machine that let me plug in my own video game and dump it, and I also plugged in my own Super Nintendo and I dumped that software so that they are literally copies of my own stuff, I can do that because it's me backing up my own data. So this emulator that I'm running is a dump of this exact calculator. So what I, I haven't stolen anything from them. I bought this and then I am making a copy of it and I am using the copy. However, if you were to just like download this stuff from the internet, that's the part that makes it like approaching legal trouble. But to be real with you, if somebody came up to you and was like, hey, did you dump that or did you download it? there would be no way to differentiate the two. Also, um, can you do number one on the first page just so I get how to do the rest? On page 36. Number one on the Law of Science page? Mm -hmm. So if you want X, then we are setting up some sort of uh, Law of Science statement. And what's important when it comes to the Law of Science is the fact that we always pair up opposite sides and angles in the construction of our ratio. And the reason why I'm saying this super explicitly is the fact that they didn't label these with variables. They're just kind of thrown on there on the triangle. So here's the triangle that we're looking at. We got 40, 80, X, and 12, where this is 40 degrees, 80 degrees, X, and 12. And so our law of sines ratio is always going to be between opposite side angle elements. So that is to say that X goes with 80 degrees, they're on opposite sides, and 12 goes with 40 degrees, they are also on opposite sides. So if you want x, <clears throat> the law of sines would instruct us that sine of 80 divided by x would be equal to sine of 40 divided by 12, solve for x. So you just cross multiply it? Uh, sure, whatever way you want to get the correct answer, but any way you do it, you should get the exact same thing. If you cross multiply and then divide, or if you uh, reciprocate both sides and solve for x, in either case, you should get that um, x is equal to uh, 12 sine 80 over sine 40. If you cross multiply, you would get 12 sine 80 equals x sine 40. And then to get x alone, you would divide sine 40 over to the other side. And then you just put it into the calculator and get an answer? Yeah, from here, there's no other manipulations you can do by hand. Okay. And the answer you got should be uh, 18.4 with some change. Keep in mind that y'all have a chapter test on Friday, so be sure to go back through your quiz, make sure you're comfortable with everything on it, and make sure that you're ready for these new skills that we've developed since. A uh, few vocab questions using angles of elevation and depression, those play out like normal trig, and then past that we need to be able to do oblique trig using the law of sines and the law of cosines. Mr. Robinson, I don't know what happened. My PC just turned off and I just turn it back on as that fine? Yeah, happens. Oh. On the on number two on the same page, like there, um, there's one pair that doesn't have an opposite. So then, what do you do? Mm hmm. How many angles do you have? Two. No, that means you have three angles. Oh. Oh yeah. That's a really common trick with the law of sines questions. They'll give you the data that way. The trick is that if you have two angles, you actually have the third, which gives you your side angle pair. Okay. Yeah, that's actually a really common trick. People who write tests think that's hella clever, even though once you know the trick, you know the trick. Oh, and by the way, hot pro tip, y'all. Um, that second homework that I posted 
uh, it's called sign law and cosine law. And then right below that, you see how it says 2011 CUDA software, LLC, all rights reserved. Yeah. Um, I don't know exactly what the deal is with that company, CUDA software that existed 10 years ago, but uh, their worksheets along with the solutions are all, are all over the internet. So if you are ever looking for extra practice on a given topic, but you wanna make sure that the practice has the answers so that you can check it easily, if you just Google the name of the skill along with the name of that company, CUDA, I guarantee you the first link is a PDF of a homework assignment along with the answers included. It's probably one of the easiest ways to find uh, additional math practice if you're ever on your own and studying. Try it for any math topic you've ever heard of. If you Google that word with CUDA, the first link is a PDF with uh, questions and answers. If you cross multiply and then divide, does it matter which one is the numerator and which one's the denominator? If you cross multiply and divide and you make no algebraic mistakes, then any answer that you end up with must be mutually true. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, we're about two minutes from the end of the class. So like I said, um, you guys have lunch off, right? Like you guys have, have a time before your afternoon fifth period? Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. Time, what time does your fifth period start? Like 1.15. Oh, ours starts 1.15. Okay. Um, here's the only reason that I ask. We normally wrap up at 12.30, but I just want you to know that on Friday, we might end up going a little bit longer. Um, and it's only due to the fact that on Friday when we come in before we start the test, um, we won't have a new question. Yeah, right. but there will be time to ask questions. So uh, if we end up starting the test a little bit late because of questions that are going to be asked at the top, then I'll extend the test time out a little bit late, um, okay. up to 15 minutes. So we might finish as late as 12.45 or 12.50 on Friday, but just so that you guys have plenty of time to do the trigonometry test. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so um, like I said, uh, if you have any questions, you know, hit me up on Classroom today or email me. Tomorrow I am incommunicado. Tomorrow I am just going to wake up, uh, hit a workout, eat some good food, and then go straight to taking an eight-hour test that determines whether or not I graduate. And then uh, I'll be back to you guys on Friday morning. Yeah. If you have if you have an X in the final answer, then how do you plug that into your calculator? You don't? X is what you're solving for. What question are you talking about? Um, the X. Like the one that we did before that you did on the screen? Oh, your X is gone. X is what you're solving for. You need to get it alone on one side with all the numbers on the other side before you plug anything into your calculator. So what question are you talking about? The second one. Uh, for question number two, what was the third angle that you got? It was 37. Uh, and that's 180 minus 52 plus 91, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, sorry, one more time. What was the angle? 37. 37. So that is to say that 20 divided by sine, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you guys write it this way. Uh, sine of 37 divided by 20 is equal mm -hmm. to sine, sine of 52 divided by x cross multiply and solve for x, this would give you that x is equal to 20 sine 52 divided then by sine 37. Oh, okay. And then you feed this to your calculator. Uh, anyway, you all have a very nice lunch. Uh, study hard. Like I said, if you guys need extra help, uh, those Khan Academy videos I posted show you exactly how to do every kind of law of sine or law of cosine question imaginable. Look at your quiz one more time before the uh, test, and I will see you all for one big chapter test on Friday. Y'all have a nice day. You too. You too. Yeah.